this week uh, we read in the portion of Akhremos. We read earlier that on the eighth day of erecting the Mishkan, which was the installation of Aaron and his sons as the Kohanim, as the priests, Nozvavil, the most two special sons of Aaron, had taken Ezorah, that's how the refers to it as an alien fire, and they brought it before Hashem, and they were immediately struck down. <coughs> and the Mishkan was sanctified through their death. This was their only sin, and they were used as the example, as the model, that regardless of how perfect you are, God, as the judge, there's no iniquity in God's judgment. God doesn't play favorites, so to say. As great as Moshe and Aaron were, but because they were slightly flawed with sin, they couldn't be the model to communicate this message. They were chosen. Bekrovi Akodesh. Those who are closest to me, I will sanctify my name. The Torah already explained to us what happened, and they died. But yet again, Hashem spoke to Moshe after the passing of the two sons of Aaron, the Korvosim of Hashem Yamusim. When they came close before Hashem, they died. We know there's nothing superfluous in the Torah. There's no reason to repeat things, and we know exactly why they died and how they died. And yet, before the Torah introduces the laws of Yom Kippur, when the high priest goes into the Holy of Holies, which is a question maybe they attempted to go to the Holy of Holies, the Torah tells us and repeats again after the passing of two sons of Aaron and the reason why they were struck down and died, Hashem says to Moshe, tell Aaron, that he's only permitted to go into the Holy of Holies, only Yom Kippur, not when he chooses to go. Although he's qualified to go in Yom Kippur, but throughout the year he's not qualified to go into the, what we call the Kodesh Kadoshim. And only when he brings the incense offering is he permitted to go there. I mean, even on Yom Kippur, when he's permitted to go, it's only for this particular service known as <coughs> Avodah Saktoris, the Avodah of the incense. Why repeat it? Why predicate the Avodos Yom Kippurim, the service of Yom Kippur, on what? The passing of the two sons of Aaron and why they died. So Rashi cites the Midrash, Torah's Kahanim. Hoya Reb Lozman Azari Omer, Moshe Le Moshe, Reb Lozman Azari he said it's the equivalent of this analogy the person was well, he comes to the doctor to be advised how to maintain himself in his illness, in his infirm state. Doctor advised, don't eat cold food. When you lie, you sleep, it should not be in a damp area. Because it could actually compromise you and you could die from this. Another patient comes with a similar illness. Oh, he says to him, don't eat cold food. Exact same thing. So you shouldn't die as so-and-so died. So whose communication is more impactful? The first communication to the first patient or the second communication to the second patient? Is there zero in the the communication of the second one is much more impactful than the first one because the second one, he has the example because the first one didn't follow his instruction. He died and he has the example. You see what happens if you follow my instruction. You will die as that so-and-so died. Therefore, the Torah tells us, predicates the entering into the Holy of Holies after the passing of the two sons of Aaron. To tell Aaron, in reality, you see what happened to your sons? It could happen to you. So the obvious question is, 
the Torah tells us many times, sometimes the Torah mentions Moshe before Aaron, Aaron before Moshe, to tell us, Shkulam Hayu. They were of equivalent status. A man of Aaron's dimension of holiness is qualified to be the high priest of Goy Godel. He has to be given an example. I mean, the word of Hashem is not enough. Hashem draws the line in the sand and says, don't cross that line. That's not enough for Aaron. He has to have an, a, an example of somebody who crossed the line and how he struck down. Anything less than that, it wouldn't be sufficient. This is Aaron. He was qualified to wear the breastplate with the dime, with the colored stones, with the shvotim, to bring the kapora, atonement for Klal Yisrael. How do we relate to this? The Rechaim HaKadoshet mentions later regarding the two sons of our own, according to one approach. The times where a person has such a desire to cleave and to be involved even if the person knows the consequences of, of his behavior, that he will die, it's worth will dying for that particular experience. To cleave to Hashem, it's worth dying. And you don't think of the consequences because it's irrelevant, the consequences. You're so taken and overwhelmed by that desire, everything else is totally blotted out. And that was not the value. Because the Medjus tells us explicitly that after Moshe and Aaron, the two greatest Jews who were meant to be their successors were not of Avihu. That's how great they were. So they're, and they were sinless. They had no sin. So their capacity and their sensitivity and desire to attach themselves to Khalif Tashem was something we can't even relate to. So therefore, understanding that, it was worthwhile. Now, Aaron, Aaron had no less of a desire. So sometimes he had no less of a desire. He'd say, you're willing, not that you're willing to take the chance, or you want to take the chance. As a result of that desire of wanting to be attached to Hashem to such a degree, one doesn't think rationally. The example I always give person, God forbid, his son falls and his child falls into a, into, into a raging river. And anybody, regardless of how well trained he is in swimming, he jumps into that, in that current, he'll be pulled away and swept away and he'll die. But because of the father's love for his child, he believes in his mind he can save that child. Not thinking of anything but saving the child. But if he be rational and see the circumstance, he'd realize he's accomplishing nothing. All he is he doing is forfeiting his life. But well, God forbid there's a fire and the fire is raging, the smoke, the father can't contain himself not to run in to save his child. He goes in, he will die. He will not come out. The firemen have to actually hold him back, restrain him. It's obvious. Because in his mind, because of his love for his child, he doesn't believe, and he doesn't think about not coming out. All he thinks about is saving his child. Endless times greater. Aaron, not Avil. Their understanding of what it means to cleave to Hashem, to go into the Holy of Holies. So therefore, unless you have that model, that example, regardless of what happens, not Avil, they were struck down because they crossed that line. Aaron. So once you have that, it's, it's not enough. Because it's not chas v'sholem, they will see themselves that they're transgressing. But rather, because of their dimension and their capacity and their relationship of understanding what it means to attach yourself to God, they don't, they don't relate to the consequences. The consequence is blatantly clear. Achrei moshnei b'nei Aaron. B'nei Aaron, who were the greatest, who were the <coughs> upcoming successors, they didn't come out alive. Our own. You will not come out alive, regardless. So that brings to focus the detail that you shouldn't be overwhelmed by the desire to attach yourself. That's why the Torah has to give this moshul, this example, even for a person as great as our own. Not that he's sinning because he's a desire to sin. 
but rather that only confirms to us where he was at. There's a question the Ramban writes over here that Speak to Aaron, your brother. He should not come when he chooses at any time into the holy. It's me based la parochas. On the inner side of the curtain, al pinea kapores. And what is there? The face of the covering of the Aaron, Hashem la Aaron, v'lo yomus. So he should not die. That's why he should not come. He be'onon eirol la kapores. Because with the cloud, I am seen on the kapores. So some explain it. He's only permitted to go there when he brings the cloud of the burning of the incense offering. Which he brings the incense offering into the Holy of Holies. Hashem says to Moshe, you should say to Aaron Ochicho. We know Aaron is his brother. It seems to be Ochicho is superfluous. So what, what does Torah say? Aaron, your brother. So the Ramban says, explains, Ochicho, shetazireno ki Ochicho. Why should you fall one? Because he's your brother. Although you are not restricted not to enter, this is the way the Ramban is explaining it. Moshe could enter whenever he chooses. Regardless of his specialness, he's your brother, he cannot go. Although he's your brother, he's not permitted to enter there. Whenever he chooses. Avul Yeshe Shiyovo Bo, but there are times he can go. Vu Masha Machaka, Vizos Yovo, Achis Bishano. Once a year he's permitted. The Tam Shigdim Al Yovo Bholeis, Kodimitsis Biosu, Achis Bashano. Im Lo Yovo Bholeis, meaning when will he merit to go that one time? If he doesn't enter whenever he chooses to enter. Then he will merit to be able to have the privilege to enter on Yom Kippur. But if he should enter any other time, even when he's permitted, now the Orachim HaKadosh says, it says, B'choleis, even on Yom Kippur, you cannot even go. Throughout the year, it's understood. Then maybe Yom Kippur, you can go. Of course, we're all at that special level. But even Yom Kippur, if it's to sacrifice, to burn the incense offering, to sprinkle the blood, then he's permitted. But even in Yom Kippur, he's not permitted. So, B'choleis, even on Yom Kippur, B'choleis. Even Yom Kippur, whenever. We'll see in a moment. We find that Moshe Rabbeinu was at a level which Chazal tell us that that he was literally the conduit, what he would speak the Shechina, the Divine Presence would speak, he'd be the medium through the his throat they would hear Hashem speaking so what does that mean? Moshe Rabbeinu, at what level was he? he was totally negated to Hashem, there wasn't a trace of himself Therefore, there's no separation to him and Hashem. Hashem didn't have to say, even if you're of the opinion that if Moshe cannot go whenever he chooses to go, which it's not so simple. So what, what did Moshe have a desire to go? Because Moshe was always there. Aaron had that slight separation. So therefore, you have a desire, you want to get closer. Moshe couldn't get closer because he was there. So Moshe didn't have to be forewarned. For him, he didn't need any examples. They see what happens when you cross the line. Because he's always cleaving. Hashem is cleaving through him. That was Moshe Rabbeinu.
we have this Ramban, he says something interesting, he gives a law. Gemari tells us that that for 40 years, when the Jews were in the desert, they were dying as a result of the sin of Muradli. There was a certain degree of melancholy, depression. Every year, anybody between the age of 20 and 60 would pass away until the end of the 40 years, that whole generation passed on. And as a result of that, the Shekhinah did not openly communicate with Moshe continuously. Why? Because, Eina Shekhinah Shore El Mitoch Simcha. The Shekhinah only comes to the Navi if he's in a state of happiness, joy. Lo Mitoch Atzvus. A person's in a state of melancholy, it doesn't happen. Now, God forbid a person's in Oni. This is before the burial of the person, of the loved one. So, for instance, an old name doesn't do mitzvahs, even the first day of the burial, which he becomes an ovel, if the death and the burial took place on that same day, first day, the ovel, the mourner does not wear tefillin. Why does he wear tefillin? Because tefillin are identified based on a possible Yecheskel. Tefillin are considered pair. It's something which is an ornament. And since the first day, the mourner is disheveled as a result of what he experienced, the level of grief, it's inappropriate you should wear the tefillin the first day. That's who he said doesn't wear. So Ramban over there explains, when did Moshe communicate this halacha, this law to a Torah? So he explains, Kimiyad Hashem bono es min min yomus. I mean, the moment his sons were struck down, he was an one. This is, they weren't buried yet. Immediately, he was told, Moshe says to Moshe, tell him, the laws which pertain to a Kohen, he's not permitted to drink any intoxicating beverage. I mean, wine, if it's already fermented or if it's semi-fermented, he cannot. But Ma'od Moshe Yazo Social Yomus Bikoros Lashem told him, in addition, he cannot get close to God. Go into the Holy of Holies. Ba'korov, Shem Shnei Mitzvah Sa'ele, Biyoma Mochros Limisosam. These mitzvahs were given the day after they passed away. Why? Ki Bibo Biyom. Because on that day, when it happened, Onein Hoyo. Aaron was an Onein. It was pre-burial. Bein Ruach HaKodesh Shore Mitoch Atzvus. And divine inspiration cannot come upon a person if he's in a state of melancholy. Therefore, it was delayed till the next day to communicate this day. It's interesting. We find that why... Did Aaron, why did he merit that the portion of which relates to the coin is not permitted to drink wine and then officiate? Why was that specifically communicated to Aaron? Because the Torah tells us after his children were struck down, it says, Vayidom Aaron. He remained silent. So over there, the Medrash tells us what was so special remained silent. Because what Moshe Rabbeinu explained to Aaron, that your children are used to bring about this level of Kiddush Hashem to be, communicate to Klal Yisrael and to the world there's no iniquity in Hashem's justice for him that was the greatest consolation he understood the value of the death of his children so if that's the case seemingly there should be Atzus it's like a person of is a patriot and his son goes to battle and his son gives his life and it changed the course of the war and there's victory. As much as he's pained, he's not depressed. It's painful that a person, God forbid, has to lose a son. But in terms of this, it's once in the history, what kind of patriot, what kind of hero was his son? His son saved thousands of lives and turned the battle and there was victory because of his son's death. That, that, that's depression, it's not depression. So, I mean, what our own experience when he heard what Moshe had explained to him, why it happened, why they were chosen. And if Vayidom, is, it says, that was the Nechama, that was his consolation. Seemingly, it's not Atzvus. It's not melancholy, it's not depression. It seems to be not so simple. But this is how the Ramban explains, because in Ruach Kodesh Shorbetoh, he could say, maybe, ecstasy is not. To be able to be a level, to be the vessel to receive the communication, the divine inspiration, Inspiration, you have to have that special level of simcha. 
so even the slightest even be tainted with this, that's enough that you're not qualified to receive the communication. That's why probably you have to understand this. We had once spoken about this, but over here the Rechaim HaKadosh speaks at length, reconciles many things. The Torah tells us that they died not about view because either they didn't consult with Moshe Rabbeinu and they went on their own and they brought this fire. Or they had drunk wine, not that they were drunk, but a Kohen drinks even as much as 2.9 ounces of wine and officiates the service is not valid. According to another Midrash, even though that's not the reason, when Moshe and Aaron would walk, none of the would walk right behind them, and they would either think themselves, they have this thought, one of these two elders is going to pass on that we should be able to assume the mantle of leadership. That's what they would think to themselves. Or they would discuss it among themselves. So Hashem says, we're going to see who dies first. Not that was the sin, but what did they mean? They didn't mean they were waiting for Moshe and Aaron to pass away. It meant that they felt, you know, there's the old generation, there's the new generation. Every generation has its own special, unique level of leadership. It's a different leadership, because the people are different. So if that's the case, one of these elders is going to pass on, but factually, it, it was tinged with a little bit of haughtiness. So Hashem says, we're going to see who dies first. But that attitude, even if it's at, the mo at a infinitesimal level, that was the cause that they didn't, they didn't console with Moshe. Well, somehow they blurred over that they drank, not that they were chas drunk, but even the slightest amount of wine disqualifies them from what? From officiating. Okay? Aaron participated in the Chetayu. And when Moshe prayed that he should be forgiven, Aaron, it says, initially all four of his sons should have died because of his sin. Moshe was only able to know 50% of the decree. They have only two of the four died. Not all four sons died. So it seems to be, why did they die? Because Aaron had sinned with the, with the eagle, with the golden calf. But it says explicitly, either they were suye yayin, they drank wine, or they were more halach of rabban. They gave a halach ruling without consulting with Moshe Rabbeinu. So how do you reconcile the two? Secondly, or thirdly, they were adults. One doesn't die for a parent's sins. Aaron sins. If Aaron sins, why should the sons? It says, Luyum so ovos al bonim. Luyum so bonim al ovos. A son doesn't die for the sins of a father unless he emulates the evil ways of a father, which was not the case. So why are they subject to death? Because Aaron had participated in the Chet Egel. Thirdly, we find that on the day of the Hakomasa Mishkan, when the Mishkan took on a permanent status, initially Aaron officiates. The, the fire doesn't come down from heaven to consume the carbon. And Moshe and Aaron go back into the old Moed and they pray. Finally, the fire comes down, and that was a confirmation that Aaron was forgiven for, for the Chet Egel. So if Aaron is forgiven for Chet Egel, what does it mean two of his sons have to die because to atone for the Chet? He was atoned. The confirmation that he was fully forgiven, Hashem accepted, embraced his service. Right? It says, Noam, the fire came down, the people, they actually, they prostrated themselves, they sang the praises of Hashem. So what do you mean? Why did they have to die? These are all questions that Orchaim asks, Akodesh asks. So he says something phenomenal over here. And he cites an Ovis Reb Nosan. Ovis Reb Nosan. He says, Lo Siksha. Halo Omru Shemesul Tzar Avon Akrevo. Laman Di Omar. According to one opinion, because they came too close to the Shechina. They went to the Holy Holies. O Laman Di Omar Laha Krovo. They had sacrificed incense, which they shouldn't have. This is the famous word. The Rabbi Bachir gives an example. 
person who's a, who's a runner. A runner. And I told him out. A person who runs for exercise. One time, a person wanted to deliver a letter. They had a messenger. He was a runner. And they were trained and experts. They covered tremendous distances in a short period of time. It's inevitable, as much as he's careful, ultimately he's going to have a foot injury. It's not possible. The, the Novi says, Shoma Ragli Hasid of Yishmar. God protects the legs, the feet of the Hasidim. The person is a Hasid. Even though it's inevitable, he will merit divine protection, he will not be harmed. We all have blind spots in life, oversights. A person truly is a chosid because he wants to do the will of God to the point he always does more than he has to do. That's his level of dedication. Hashem will make sure that goes beyond the human level. He will not sin. Hashem will not allow him to sin. That's Ragli Hasid of Yishmar. He will protect them. Now, in whose merit should not of you be protected? In their own merit, it wasn't sufficient. It would be in the merit of their father. In the merit of their father, they should be protected, that they shouldn't make this mistake. But because Aaron himself had participated in Chet Egel, his merit wasn't sufficient, it should protect his children, to have that level of clarity. Therefore, they made the mistake. And because they made the mistake, they were compromised, okay? It says, but they had to die because they had to be the modicum, or they had to be the model of there's no iniquity in Hashem's justice. He says, Kim loyo avonu egel. He says something phenomenal. Hoy mischayov melokea mishva diskari shabais puzulosam. The mishkod would have been sanctified without them. If there wouldn't have been a Chet Egel, the Jews would have been on a different level. They would have a different level of clarity. They would, just that the Mishkan itself would have been evidence that there's no iniquity in Hashem's Mishpat, in His justice. But because there was a Chet Egel, so that's why there is this slight blind spot. So you need that. You need that new level of clarity to confirm this reality that there's no iniquity in God's justice. God desires whenever he sanctifies himself. It should always be through the chasidim, through the most holy, the most pious. He says, why? If the chasid is so pure and so perfect, he's almost sinless. Why does Hashem take his life? So Shia Litzadik, this is a very fundamental principle he cites the officer of Nosen. Hashem wants to use the tzaddik as the model of schar v'onish. But if he's so perfect, what does he want to take the tzaddik? And so he explains, Tzor shi tzaddik koshu me advorim ha-shalotu hasos. God just can't take a tzaddik. The tzaddik is, is literally, there's not even a, the slightest taint of sin, nothing. How does he take him? As an example, example of what? How do you think a person is fully innocent to take his life? So therefore, Hashem presents something that is something that Tzadik does, which in its own right doesn't deserve this level of punishment. But he's not totally perfect. That Midas Adin, the attribute of justice, doesn't have a claim. To be able to withstand Midas Adin, the attribute of justice, you have to be perfect beyond perfect. So the Tzadik is not perfect beyond Tzadik, perfect. So, but Hashem doesn't normally implement the attribute of justice. But since Hashem wants to bring about a point, and to prove a point, He uses the chosid as that model to bring it about. He says, What's proof of this? Reb Kiva was the greatest sage of his generation. I mean, that he deserved to be killed and murdered and tortured a person of his dimension of holiness, the Torah that he disseminated. Reb Kiva was lecturing 600,000 people in Torah. 
And during that lecture, he had a moment, a fleeting moment of pride. Could you imagine? But it's almost impossible not to have it. Komer B'divreim. So he asks, V'kosha lozu yischayv enosh misa mishuna. For having that fleeting moment of, of joy, he should deserve this misa mishuna, this uncouthly, terrible death, to be tortured to death, and have his flesh scaped off his body. It's like you've undermined the rose, the rose petals. You've destroyed the crown of Torah. As they say, what did the Malachim say? Zu Torah, zu Shora. This is the Torah, this is the reward for the Torah. What lesson should they take away from this? Because Ose Tov and Om Deo, the more you do, the more culpable you become. As they say, you know, in the vernacular, no good deed goes unpunished. Chas Shalom. That's the person doesn't understand. El Dezeu, Derech Shivmel Yishlot Boabim. Because he's so perfect, therefore, Hashem allows certain things to happen that he should be the model for me this Adin. Because for me this Adin, you're never perfect enough. Ul Olam Sibas Misoso. Why is the cause of his death so precious? Yokar Hashem, Be'ena Hashem, Hamovsal Chasidov. The Movsal, death. Could you imagine? Because you might God says, You're precious. Death for you is precious. Why? It's not only the Tzaddik. La Sora Rugi Malchus. The ten martyrs, there were no such ten people in one generation, only going back to Sinai. Take the most ten special Jews and have them all murdered by the Romans. It should be a shield and a protection for all the generations of the Jews till the end of time. You understand? Oh, because only through them can you bring about that, that end result. But God can't take their lives unless you could attribute some level of failing to them. Gemara says, Rabbi Hanan Yuvin Shrajo, it says they took a Sefer Torah and they wrapped him and they burnt him to death at the stake. And they had the Roman executioner. He had sponges of wool soaked in, in water and he kept putting it on his heart to keep him alive as long as he can so he should suffer to a greater degree. He said to the Roman executioner, if you take it off my heart, that I shall die sooner, I guarantee you a share of the world to come. So the Roman executioner took, took them off, and he jumped into the fire and committed suicide. And there was a heavenly voice that says that this person, he has a share of the world to come. Of course, he facilitated the death of Rav Hanin of Entrajo. Now, what did he do so terrible? What did he do so terrible? So Mark explains in Abu Zoro, that he was a her heretic. He had a tztuki, a sadducee, which they don't believe in the oral law. And he'd taken a posuk, and he said like, a very witty type of interpretation. It was false, but it was witty. And he somehow enjoyed the wittiness of it. Because I'm so witty, for that he deserves. The disseminator of Torah. He was the father of Remeir. Deserves this type of death, same idea. This is the Midas Adin. Except Hashem will even, there has to be a reason even Midas Adin. They would have been perfect that even Midas Adin couldn't have taken, taken hold of them. Therefore, he allowed this to happen. He explains, the Tam Zed knows in Tam the Shevach Gamash of the So we told him Midas Adin. Aaron was, was atoned with his Korban. The fire came down, consumed, and accepted his Avoda. So what's left? But you know something, for me to say then, it's never perfect enough unless it's totally perfect. So that, that he accepted the Korban and the Avodah service of our own, to atone for Klau Yisrael, and whatever may be, that's me to say But in terms of the confirmation that there's no iniquity in Hashem's justice, there's still a trace. For me to say then, it's still not perfect enough. Therefore, Aaron's children were taken. They didn't merit that clarity. The Ragli Hasidic Yishmo, they didn't merit. And only after that, then it was totally cleansed and wiped clean. There's a word they say, the mitzvah of the Yom Kippur, the 
Torah says, Lefnei Hashem Titaru. Before God, you should be purified. Now, the two expressions. You could wipe something clean. Purified is another level. Purification. When you purify something, what is it? There's no trace. It's not just surface-wise. It, it's restored to a pure state. You see, Yom Kippur, although Yom Kippur is Midas HaRachmin, but after the Rachman brings about purity, there's no basis for Midas Adin anymore. There's no Midas Adin. Midas Adin is only if there's a trace. But if there's no trace, there's no base for Midas Adin anymore. Because God already forgave and brought allowed about a level of purity. Because that's the Rachmim of Yom Kippur, that although it may not be the most perfect tshuva, but Hashem says, Lefnei Hashem Titaru, you should be purified before, before, before Hashem. And if you follow that procedure, the end result is that. Explains. Why does it have to say prior to the Avodos Yom Kippurim he's going to the Holy of Holies? Achri Moshe the You know what the answer is? To be qualified to go into the Kodesh Kodesh the Holy of Holies. This is Midas Adin. It was only after his children passed away. The service initially that he brought the Shechina into the Mishkan that was Midas Arachmi. Now that you're going to the Holy of Holies, it's no longer. This is Midas Adin. For Midas Adin, it's only Achri Moshe Bnei Aaron. It was only because the sons were taken from him. Now there's not even a trace of sin. Now that there's not even a trace of sin, even Midas Adin will be agreeable. He's qualified to be the Kohen Gadol, the high priest going to the Holy of Holies to officiate. tells us that during the first temple period which is 410 years there were either 13 Kohanim with Olim, 13 high priests who spanned that whole period of maybe 18 the second temple period there were over 300 priests 420 year period over 300 Kohanim with Olim. every year the Kohen Godel would go into the Holy of Holies he wouldn't make it out they would have to put a rope around his waist to pull him out. Why? Because they used to buy the position from the Roman governor to be the high priest. They went to the highest bidder. So as much as they believed they were qualified, but to be qualified to go into the Holy Holies, Holies you have to be at that special level. And of those years, 40 years, Shimon Atzadik officiated. So they dug 40 years from 420. So what's left, there were over 300 priests. 300 Kohanim Gedolim. So you can imagine what went on over there. It was only during the first bias, because it says bezos yovo aron al kodesh, bezos. So the Torah says bezos. The word bezos, with this is begematria four hundred and ten. So Rashi says what's bezos? That the simul taron al kohen. He says, Bzos, Rashi, the Devaluturim, Gemachi shall Arba Meos Be'eser. Remez Labais Rishon, that alludes to the, the years of the first temple stood. So the, so the Sivs Chum explains, says something interesting. So what does that do, Bzos? It says, Bzos Yavu Aaron Ela Kodesh. Right? Aaron. Aaron did live 410 years. There were another, either another 12 quantum gadol, another 17. So the, so the Sifschum explains now, during by how does a person become a high priest? Besides wearing eight vestments, they would anoint him with the anointing oil. To be anointing with the anointing oil, it was a special level. During by Sheni, it says they hid, hid away the anointing oil, and all the high priests who officiate during by Sheni, during the second temple period, it was through Rebbe Begodim. They put on the eight vestments and they officiated. When they officiated with the eight vestments, that's when they rose to the level of high priest. It's a different reality. During the first temple period, it was the anointing oil. So all the high priests, the Pekan of Gedolim, during the Bayes Rishon, the first temple period, had this commonality with Aaron. As Aaron, how did he become the high priest? 
through the anointing oil, all the other Kohanim Gedolim also became high priests through the anointing oil. That's how it came about. There's a Kliyokr, and the Kliyokr is difficult based on what the Orachim had cited. It says, Lo Yavu B'chol Eisel HaKodesh. Al Yavu B'chol Eisel. He cannot come whenever he chooses. And he cites the Torah Skalim, even the Yom Kippur. Let's say Yom Kippur, he wants to come. He wants to go back and put an extra prayer there. It's not permitted. Only if what's prescribed to do, he does, which is the ketores, the incense offering, and sprinkling the blood. It's not only b'chol eis throughout the year, even the Yom Kippur. He explains, interesting way he learned the Kli Yoker. Besides Chazal, Chazal say that Hasotom numerically is 364. So the Gemara tells us that there's one day a year that Satan cannot prosecute the Jewish people. That's Yom Kippur. That's how overwhelmingly intense is the attribute of mercy. So he explains The reason why the coin cannot go in there, he's only representative of the people, and the people themselves are sinners. Because the guilt of the people is associated, identifies with him. Hmm. Why? The Jews are compared to angels on Yom Kippur. That's what we say. Baruch Hashem called them out so long and out loud. It's like we super, we transcend time. We're not subject to time. Yom Kippur is not a part of it. What's the allusion to this? The numerical value of Sotan is, is 364. But the solar year is 365. Kulam that mankind is subject to the influence of the Yitzhara and the Sotan, 364. Mm -hmm. Sotan cannot, does not reign on Yom Kippur. This day is unique. It's not a part of time. So therefore it says, If it's Ace, time, which is Ordinary time, he can't go. He's not permitted, but this is not ordinary time. Because this day is removed from sin. The difficulty is, we just said, the Taurus Khanum says, that even on Yom Kippur, he's only permitted to go there, only to do the service of the incense offering and sprinkle only the blood. So even on Yom Kippur, he's not permitted. So I'm showing, so what he says is not really accurate. Meaning, agotically, it sounds beautiful. But factually, it's not correct. Because it says he's not permitted to go whenever, at any time, even Yom Kippur any time, only for what's prescribed on that particular day. You know, we read, just we'll finish with this, the, uh, there's the famous Ramban, I saw Lazozel, there were two goats of identical cost, ident they looked identically, and he would draw lots. One lot said Lashem, and the other lot said Lazozil. One was designated, consecrated to brought as a sacrifice to atone for Klal Yisrael in the base of Migdash, and that was for Tumas Migdash for Kodoshov, for, for the contamination of a person eating sacrificial meat when it's contaminated, going to the base Migdash when it's contaminated. The other was for all sins. That was the goat that was thrown down the outside, which was dismembered. 
that carried all the sins of Kalal Yisrael. Now the question is, what is the concept? What is the idea of this? So over there he cites a picture of Rebbe Lezer. A picture of Rebbe Lezer was written by Rebbe Lezer Ben Hurkins, Rebbe Lezer Godel, that what is the location of all the nether forces? Desert, locations of desolation. That's where the demons are. Everything impure is out there. Why? He says, because that's the location of Samach Ben. Anything impure, anything negative, anything which is contrary to Kedusha emanates from Samach Ben. It's so impure, we don't even mention. That's what we call the Sitra Achra. That's what it is. So he says, the Sola Zozel, it's not what we bring Chas Rishol, a sacrifice to an angel. That's called, that's idolatry. Proof of the issue is, how does the each goat assume its status? It's not the one who draws the lots, the going goat, the high priest, consecrates them. He takes out the lot, it says Lashem, he puts it on, it says Lashem, but Hashem is the consecrator. La Zozel, who designated it as the goat that goes down the mountain, the God himself, is not, and where is it done? It's done outside the Mishkan, outside the base of English. That's what it is. So he says, what level of impurity does this goat see? He says, what is it about? A person makes a banquet for all his subjects. He has some servants, and he has to give them something of the banquet, otherwise they could actually, they could interfere with, 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 the, with the celebration at the banquet. So you throw him a bone, you throw him a few crumbs. The sol azozel is to acknowledge, it's to throw the sitra achra, the samach mem, to give him something. That he shouldn't in any way interfere, understand? He normally is the prosecutor of the Jewish people, the samach mem, that's the soto. He prosecutes fiercely. But by satisfying him, with acknowledging him that he exists by giving him this animal, it's purely acknowledgement. God's giving acknowledgement. He's not going to interfere. Mm-hmm. What does he say? What does he say because of this? So the picture of the Revelation says like this. Benosa hasor olov. This goat carries, and the story says, it says picture of the it's like giving bribery. That they should, they should not in any way nullify the carbon we bring. The girl of Akarishbohu that brought as a regular sacrifice. The girl of Azozil, all the sins of the Jews are on that goat. Shenema, Venosa Sor Olov. I just want to mention earlier, he quotes a Medrash. Nosa Sor Olov, Ze or Esov. Sawyer is referred to Esov, Edom. Shenema, Hein Esov, Ochi is Sawyer. Hairy. Why is a goat called a Sawyer? Because it's hairy. A sheep has fleece, it's soft. A goat is goat's hair, it's prick, it's sharp. And it says, "Es kol avonosam." This sawyer carries all avonosam. So he says it's a conjunction. Avonos tam, the sins of the tam. Who's the tam? Yaakov Yishtam Yishev The sins of the one whose children who are tam, they're perfect. So what does the samachan say when we bring this, this goat which we throw down the mountainside? He sees the Jews are sin free on your kipper. He comes before Hashem. This is the prosecutor of the Jewish people. He says, Master of all the worlds. It's unbelievable. You have mortals who exist in the terrestrial level. They're like angels in heaven. Just as angels go barefoot. They, they wear, wear no shoes. Kachin, you show you have you regal the only point. These Jews, they don't wear shoes. Mama Cheshores, in be machidu shtio, just as an angel does need or drink. Kachin, you show you in be machidu shtio. This is the Sultan, the greatest prosecutor. 
Malach shows Eilim Kfitzo. Kach Omdim Arag Leim Biyom Kippurim. They don't walk around. We stay stationary in one location. Malach Hashor Sholem Metavach Beinayim. This tremendous peace among them. Kachim Shor Sholem Metavach Beinayim Biyom Kippurim. It's interesting. We find by by uh, Yovel, all properties return to the original owner. All slaves are are actually freed. If you pick a day that property should go back, which we're talking about material assets, would you pick Yom Kippur as the day? Yom Kippur is the most solemn, holiest day of the year. You know, you pick another day. Yom Kippur, a day that we're immersed in tshuva and spirituality, and that's our focus. All of a sudden, all our assets are returning. The asset that the family sold 50 years ago, now it's coming back. You know why? Because the person who had a property for 50 years, to release that, you gotta be an angel. The only time we're able to deal with that is only when we're connected at that level and we let go. During the year, we don't let go so quickly. This is Sholem. The level of Sholem among Jews on Yom Kippur is something out of the ordinary. It's only because we see everything as minutia. When you see the value of spirituality, everything becomes minutia, becomes not essential, unimportant. Just as an angel is sin free, this is what Samach Mem says. What does Akash Baruch say? Akash Baruch Hu, Shomei Dusa No Yisrael Men Akatego Shalem. Hashem listens to this testimony from the arch prosecutor against the Jewish people. And he atones for us on the altar, the Migdosh Al Kohanim Al Kol Am Kol, and all the Jewish people. Shenemar Vechiperes Migdash Hakodesh. This is the picture of Blazer. This is the concept of the Sarla Zozer. But let's see, we wouldn't bring the soul out also. He'd make trouble. We're throwing him, as he says, it's compared to Shohan. We're bribing him. It's bribery. But if it's if the numerical value of Hasoto is 364, what do we have to bribe him? God clips his wings, keeps him muzzled. No. He gave us a mechanism to muzzle him. It's called bribery. That that's what it is. It's not, he does, he exists. But because of what we do, that's why he's silent. You read the Gemara, it seems to be, he, he, he's not operative on that day. God doesn't allow him, no, God allows him. It's because of our initiative, that's why he's not operative. That's why it's only 364. And that's the reason we have the Avodah on Yom Kippur. Neshalma Parm Suaseno. We go through the Psukim and understanding what the service was because if we wouldn't do that, and God values that as if we're bringing, doing that vote in the Beis Amigdash, and only if we prostrate ourselves, as they prostrate themselves in the Beis Amigdash. Because again, unless we go through these motions and understand it, and God values our verbalization of this as if we were actually doing it, we got the Sultan even on Yom Kippur. We have the prosecution. It's very interesting. Rosh Hashanah is, is Yom Adin, Day of Judgment. There's no, we don't do true by Rosh Hashanah. Hashem says, Imrud Fani Malchus, Kadesh Namuchani Alnechem. Say verses of kingship, so you should accept my kingship upon yourselves. What about Shuva? So there are many answers. So we once explained if a person does Shuva and you have Midas Adin, could you do a, a perfect Sure, it's impossible. It's Yom Adin. It has to be so perfect that there's no trace whatsoever of that sin. You know what level of remorse you have to have? It's impossible. Hashem says, you know something? It's not going to work. I love you. It's not, there's only one way. Here you're on the chopping block. You can be judged for life and death. And you know what you talk about? You only talk about my glory. You don't talk about yourselves. Son comes, he wants to prosecute you. You know what I say to him? Do you know what kind of dedicated subjects, servants I have? Here they have a record which they could be prosecuted and condemned. 
and they're not concerned about themselves. They're only concerned about me. Is there such a nation in the world? It's unheard of such people. There's a Nasev and Ishma people. Comes to Yom Kippur. This, this is Midas Arachmi. You know something? Today we could, we could work it out with Shura. It's not perfect. You know something? It's okay. This is Midas Arachmi. But what about the prosecutor? Once he opens his mouth, we've got a problem. If so, Lazozil. God gave us the payoff. We give, give him the goat. That's the, that's the shokha. That's the bribery. So each one, God gives up the mechanisms, how to deal with him. One sense, we silence him with the schus of the shofar, the akedo, and we only talk about Hashem, we don't talk about ourselves. And when it comes to the Yom Kippur, we have the sola zozel, that's the bribery, and therefore we're able to do tshuva. It's not perfect, but that's rachmim. Why is it rachmim? Because when the prosecutor can't open his mouth to prosecute, that engenders the highest, the most advanced level of rachmim.